Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inizor Education. Um, today we will talk about fields, um, primarily electromagnetic fields. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on Unizor.com, and that's where I suggest you to watch this lecture from, because this lecture is part of the course, and the Unizor.com website contains a uh, menu uh, which can lead you in logical sequence to all the lectures which are participating in this course, plus every lecture has detailed notes uh, on the website which basically can serve as a textbook. Um, there are exams, problem solving, etc. Um, and it's totally free, no ads, no strings attached. So, the field waves, that's the theme of this particular lecture. Well, let's talk about fields first. Well, we used to have to deal with material objects, something which we can just see and, and touch and, and basically feel what, what these objects are using our senses. Well, fields are different. Um, in some cases you can feel the, let's say, electric field. If you touch some um, charged uh, electrode, <coughs> you, you probably will feel it in your tactiles or, or your hair might actually go up because of electrostatics. Um, but that's rarely. Um, right now, the electromagnetic waves are, are all around us, but we don't feel them we don't see them, so what, what exactly they are, and uh, how can we study something like this? Well, let me go back to mathematics. Math for teens, by the way, is a prerequisite course for this physics for teens, and it's presented on the same website. So let's go back to mathematics. In mathematics, we are studying certain objects, like number or uh, n-dimensional vector space. Well, these are abstract objects, they do not exist. There is no number. There are five sheep, but there is no number as, as a concept. It's something which we have come up with to, to study certain groups of objects. And then we came up with irrational numbers, for instance, and we are considering them as, as, as numbers and we study them, but what are they? I mean, in decimal representation they have an infinite number of uh, digits, so it's kind of difficult to deal with in material sense. Still, we are dealing with these abstract objects. Now, how? Well, based on properties. So we basically are abstract ourselves from material representation of some kind of uh, entity or abstraction which we are talking about and we concentrate on the properties of this object. So we don't really care what n-dimensional uh, vector space is, but we do care about properties of this particular object which we have created in our minds. And if two different things have the same properties, and we have a theory which kind of predicts new properties, well, both will have them. So our abstract thinking helps us to understand the properties of all objects which correspond to our abstract model. Well, the same thing with fields, basically. Um, we don't know much about what is a material um, kind of background what is the base, material base of, of fields. Well, it's part of a space where certain properties are, can be demonstrated. For instance, if you will place uh, an, an electron in, in magnetic field, it will probably um, uh, turn from its trajectory depending on where exactly the magnetic field is, is directed. Um, so, Basically, we are talking about properties of these fields, not about their material uh, substance. And that's very important. 
we don't really well not that we don't care but we don't really want to talk about uh, what stands behind some kind of an object which is a subject of our theory but we do care about the properties of these objects and that's how our theory can develop now in physics we have experiments and if our model um, which we have developed based on certain old experiments doesn't correspond to a new experiment well we change the model we update it we modify it we we do something with this model or completely abandon it and, and come up with a new model and based on that model we learn uh, what exactly the properties are, what new properties might actually be, and then the new experiments come to either confirm or reject uh, our conclusions. So that's what I would like you actually to think about fields um, in this particular direction. So forget about what exactly field is in the material sense. Think about the properties of the field. Again, the properties are something which we can learn, which we can build some formulas about. Uh, you remember the Coulomb's, for instance, formula about two charged particles, or two charged object or point object, whatever, and they have certain either attraction or repulsion based on their charges and their distances. Well, that's a theory. Uh, we can start explaining it well, there are electrons and there are uh, um, excess of electrons, uh, deficiency of electrons, positive, negative, etc. That's our theory. We, w when we developed that thing, we didn't really you know, know much about what are the electrons. All right, so that's kind of an introduction into concept of a field. In uh, so, so you don't really... Um, feel lost when somebody is asking you what, what exactly field field is. Well, it's just part of space where certain properties can be de demonstrated. But based on these properties, we built a model. And the model actually allows us to put some formulas around, some predictions maybe for new properties, and they might or might not be ro wrong or right or whatever. Okay. Now, we will talk about, this lecture is only about electromagnetic fields. Yes, there are other fields, uh, like gravitational field right now, and uh, they might or might not have certain waves. Um, well, I know there are certain experiments which kind of indicated that maybe gravitational um, field also has certain waves and that's how it propagates. Um, whether it's right or wrong I don't know, but uh, for electromagnetic uh, fields we do know that there are waves and we are really have a very well developed theory about these waves and in particular it explains why for instance we see the stars light uh, even if there is no carrier between us and the stars the light from the star somehow comes to us and we see it. Um, and so that's kind of a propagation without the real material in the usual sense of this word, carrier. Um, if, if you have a rope and you are um, moving up and down one end, then you see how the waves are propagated and the rope is exactly the carrier of these uh, waves. In case of electromagnetic um, field, since there is no uh, uh, medium, there is no carrier of these waves, there is a vacuum in the space, right? Uh, so how, how come they actually reach us? Well, the theory explains it, and I'll just try to explain it in my own words. Uh, again, not perfect explanation, but still reasonable. Okay. <coughs> so talk about electromagnetic uh, field and let me start from something which we have experimentally um, observed well not be personally but I mean people experimentally observed and we have learned 
in um, uh, the chapter which is called electromagnetism of this particular course. Now obviously I will relate to electromagnetism um, chapter very heavily um, when talking about the field. So I, I suggest you if you didn't really um, study that particular part, please do it. It's uh, previous to this one. The waves is secondary and electromagnetism was before that. Okay, so the experiment, which is kind of one of the first experiments, was as follows. If you have a straight line, wire, and there is certain electric current in it, well, if you put some kind of a table here and uh, put uh, some small metal uh, parts, and you will do some kind of a vibration a little bit, just knock a little bit, so they will form circles. Now, what does it signify? Well, our theory says that this is um, uh, the flow of electrons, and as electrons are moving, around them exists a magnetic field, and magnetic field acting on these metal particles on this table um, makes them magnetic, so they are kind of sticking to each other. And magnetic field has certain direction, so at any point there is a force um, which actually acts, and the force are uh, concentric uh, circles. Well, the experiment shows this, so our theory follows the experiment, and our theory is that around moving um, uh, electrons you have the uh, uh, perpendicular to it uh, magnetic field. Well, why electrons are moving? Well, we can say that okay, maybe there is a plus and minus on both sides, charges, so electrons are moving from negative to, to positive. Um, well, the, the current, by definition, moves from positive to, 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 to negative, but that's historical kind of a uh, deviation. But in any case, moving electrons. Okay, so moving electrons are causing the, um, the magnetic field, and electrons are moving because there is a difference in potential, electropotential, plus and minus. Well, what does it mean that there is a difference in potential? Well, there is an electron electric field actually there is some something which forces the electrons to move why do they move because there is an electric field so electric field causing electrons to move and um, uh, moving electrons are causing the magnetic field around it well but let me just drop the electrons from this picture because what happens is that its electric field produces the magnetic field, so to speak. Yes, through the electrons in this particular case. But now, next logical step is the following. What if magnetic, what if elec electric field is not constant? So it's not a direct current here, for instance, but alternate current. So the uh, electrons are moving back and forth. Well, well, then magnetic field also will be changing directions. It will be uh, either this direction or that direction, the forces. Forces here. B. Okay, so the variable electric field produces, well, causing, is, is causing the existence of variable magnetic field. Okay. Fine. Now, let's go to another experiment, the electromagnetic induction. So if you remember, if you have some kind of a wire in a loop and you have a magnet, which you move in and out of this loop, you can observe the electric current 
And why electric current? Well, because obviously it must be electric field. Only because of electric field exists with different potentials on two sides, that's what makes electrons moving. So in this particular case, variable magnetic field, and it's variable because we are moving it up and down. So the variable magnetic field is creating electric field inside this loop. And that's why electrons are moving. So we have two different things, actually, which are, well, re reversing each other. We have a variable electric field is producing variable magnetic field around it, and variable magnetic field is producing variable electric field around it. Do we need a conductor here? And, and here, these uh, loops where electrons are actually moving? Well, apparently not. I mean, if you will have it, electrons will move. But if you don't have it, electric field or magnetic field will exist by themselves. So this is a property of the concept of this uh, thing which we call a field. Field is just a piece of space, part of the space, where certain forces exist. But they exist independently of whether we put some kind of into this field or not. Field exists by itself. So here, it's not really necessary. As long as we have some kind of a variable electric field, it will produce the variable magnetic field. The variable magnetic field will produce variable electric field. So what happens is the following. Let's say initially you have a real electrons which are actually moving, let's say, in a circle. It doesn't really matter. Now, these electrons will produce magnetic field, which is inside it. Remember, that's how electromagnet actually is done, right? You have some kind of a um, core, and then you have um, wire around it. You put uh, electric uh, uh, current uh, into, the, into the wire, and uh, this core will, will be magnetized, right? So there is a magnetic... Um, uh, field inside this. Now, how this field is arranged? Well, it's arranged ac ac actually in loops as well. These are magnetic lines, right? So, now, these are loops of magnetic lines, and again, if this is variable, this will be variable. Now, if this is variable, this is magnetic. Now, if this is variable, then it will produce perpendicularly to this electric field, also variable. Now we don't have even the um, wire loop. The uh, field will exist by itself. And then, since this is also a variable thing, it will produce another B, another electric field. So this is E, electric field. So, as you see, once uh, created the variable, let's say in this case, electric field is, variability is very important. Now, the constant electric field is producing constant uh, magnetic, but magne constant magnetic doesn't really produce any electric. So we need the variability. So as long as we have initial variable um, uh, electric field, it will produce the variable magnetic which in turn will produce variable electric, which in turn will produce variable magnetic, and it will propagate into all directions, basically. And that's how the light from the stars come to us. Because what happens in the star, or in our sun, is just huge kind of flows of elementary particles electrons, protons, whatever. It's, it's a big mess. And obviously there is a huge amount of uh, electricity and magnetism which are in this mess. And it propagates because every little piece of um, uh, variable, every little part of the space where variable electric um, field exists will produce the magnetic field and it will produce variable electric field and variable magnetic etc and it goes in all directions and it's so strong because the stars are so bright and there is so much is going on over there 
that the power of this radiation, let's talk, let, let, let's use the word radiation, that's basically a propagation of electromagnetic waves. So it reaches us regardless of how far they are. Now, obviously, it's getting, <coughs> it's getting weaker and weaker with the distance, and it's uh, inversely proportional to square distance, obviously, as, as everything else we know in this three-dimensional space, because the, it goes through this spherical kind of surface, and on each real piece of uh, the surface, uh, it goes proportionally to, uh, inversely proportionally to square, square of distance. Okay, so that's how the light propagates, that's how radiation propagates, electromagnetic waves are propagating. Now, we probably can reasonably safely um, consider that the variability is kind of sinusoidal. It's not sinusoidal, it's kind of sinusoidal, because obviously these up and downs, they do not you know, represent a, a clearly defined um, sinusoid uh, curve uh, with their ups and downs. However, to a very certain degree, um, we can actually consider um, this to be based on sinusoids or a, a combination of different sinusoids. Now, um, in mass, you can learn that basically with combination of different sinusoids, we can approximate any function. Um, so, um, it's, it, it's indeed the fact that any kind of um, complex radiation is actually a combination of more elementary radiation of different sinusoids with different amplitudes and different um, periods. Okay, now, what else? What else is important is, as you see, whenever it goes, direction it goes this way, um, the loops of magnetic field and loops of electric field are perpendicular to each other. And also, all, all of them are perpendicular to the direction of uh, propagation. Let's go back to the initial thing. Now, the initial with the direct current, there's no propagation, so to speak. But you can see that if this is a direction of the electric um, current, this and this is tangential to a, to a loop, it will be perpendicular. So, now, if you have a variable thing here, like here for instance, the propagation is this way, but um, our uh, magnetic field will be in this particular um, plane and it will be perpendicular to the propagation. And this will be in the horizontal plane and it will also be perpendicular to propagation. So what I would like to say is that vector E is always perpendicular this is um, intensity of the electric field, this is intensity of the magnetic field, and they are both uh, perpendicular to the um, vector of speed of uh, propagation um, of this particular uh, radiation. And it goes to this direction, to all directions, and on all directions we have different um, directions of um, intensity of the electric field, uh, magnetic field, and the, prop and the vector of propagation, vector of speed. So, in the notes for this lecture, I have kind of nice um, picture of how the waves are going. Um, I, I do suggest you to, to go to the website to this particular lecture, and notes contain this picture where in one color I represent the waves of propagation of electric field and uh, I think blue one are magnetic field or vice versa and they all go to a three-dimensional like x, y and z axis one axis goes the propagation, another axis are the amplitude of the electric field and the third axis is um, amplitude of uh, magnetic field
So it's a nice picture which kind of explains how the whole thing is governed. Um, okay, and um, the last thing which I would like to touch is the speed of propagation. Now, um, there is, um, when, when we were talking about um, uh, electricity and magnetism in the electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetism chapter of this course, we were talking about um, uh, characteristics of space or um, some kind of conductor or whatever it is called um, electric uh, electric permittivity permittivity and we were talking about magnetic field we were talking about uh, permeability permeability now both of these concepts are basically playing the same role as resistance for electric current. Well, you know that the greater the resistance, the, the, the more difficult it is for the electric current to go through. Okay, this is the same thing but for the space. Now the electric or magnetic field there, there are fields, right? So they are kind of part of space. Now, what's inside that space? Well, it can be vacuum, it can be air, it can be glass, it can be water, because uh, electromagnetic um, field actually is um, uh, going into all, all different kind of through all different kind of substances, but differently. And these two characteristics they're called epsilon and mu, are characterizing the uh, environment where electromagnetic field is actually um, acting. Now, with an index zero, it indicates the properties of the vacuum. So everything is related to a vacuum. And then if you would like to have this same characteristic, let's say, for water, well, usually it's characterized by relative um, permittivity or permeability, relative to vacuum. So, if you would like to say it's relative is equal to epsilon times mu relative is equal to real mu. So these are real permeability of, of the environment and they are usually measured in vacuum times certain coefficient. Now, what's interesting is that the speed of propagation of, let's say, light or any other electromagnetic <coughs> wave related to the environment where they are actually propagating. And there is a very nice formula. And the formula is Now, I'm, I'm not um, deriving this formula in this lecture, and uh, uh, I, I might actually put it as notes, I'm not sure, but it's an interesting, nice-looking uh, nice formula, which gives you basically the speed of propagation based on properties of the environment. Um, now, um, if you would like to have the speed of light in the vacuum, you obviously have to put epsilon, uh, epsilon zero and, and, and mu zero here. So these are vacuum, these are relative, and these are actual for any kind of a, uh, environment. And this is how the speed of light actually um, is related to permittivity and permeability of the space. By the way, these are kind of the same thing, the meaning of these words uh, is the same. I don't know why they have decided to call it differently. I think nowadays they're just changing it to electric constant and magnetic constant for vacuum or for any other um, environment. So with this nice formula, I would like to finish this particular lecture. It's supposed to give you some kind of a taste of what exactly the field's electromagnetic field primarily is and how it propagates. Um, 
Well, that's it. I would suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. So you go to unisor.com, uh, Physics for Teens is your course, and there is a chapter called Waves, and this is uh, the topic which is called Field Waves, which contains, probably will contain more than one lecture, but right now there is one lecture, which is this one, ready. All right, thank you very much, and good luck.